Today we're going to talk about chapter 13, which involves chemical equilibrium. We're going to cover section 1 and 2. So section 1 talks about the equilibrium condition. What influences a chemical reaction being at equilibrium? Okay, well, chemical equi equilibrium is a state where concentrations of all the reactants and products remain constant with time. So at this point, we've got reactants going to products and products going to reactants all at the same rate. Not all reactions go to completion where all the reactants get used up and produce just products. So a lot of times we have things that are at chemical equilibrium where we've got reactants and products both. So we say that when things go to equilibrium, they're either far to the right or far to the left. Far to the right means that at equilibrium, we have mostly products, but we still have some concentration of reactants left, but more products than reactants. When it's far to the left, we have a lot more, a larger concentration of reactants than products. So not much product has been produced. We still have a lot of reactants. Okay, well, equilibrium is not static. Once equilibrium is reached, it doesn't mean that everything just stays in place. It's dynamic. It's constantly moving. So if you think about cars on a bridge, uh, let's say you've got two towns connected by a bridge and there's an equal number of cars in both towns. If cars are moving across the bridge at equilibrium, it's constant. So the number of cars in each town is constant, even though there are still cars moving across the bridge all the time. It's just that the same number of cars are moving from town A to town B as the same number of cars that are moving from B to A. So there's still motion, it's just that the overall numbers aren't changing. And so that's kind of also like what happens in a chemical reaction. Reactants are going to products and products are going to reactants, but it's occurring at the same rate. And so we say that equilibrium. So let's take a look at this reaction. We've got water reacting with carbon monoxide, or water vapor with carbon monoxide. And this double arrow can also be written like this. Okay, to show that the reaction is at equilibrium and can occur in both directions. So we've got, this is our forward reaction, and then this would be the reverse. Taking the products and going back to reactants. Okay, so let's look at the graph for this reaction. So if we've got concentration on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, We've got our reactants following this sort of path. So this would be H2O or carbon monoxide. And then our products, are we're starting with very little concentration of products. And we have something that looks like this. And so this would be concentration of h 2 or concentration of CO2. So if you know, if we extended this out, of it, what's going to happen is that at some point in time, and maybe I would say maybe about here, we have constant lines. Nothing else is really occurring as far as concentration. And so we would say that from here on, we are in equilibrium. Okay, and so we've still got reactants producing products and products producing reactants, but they're at the same rate or same concentration. Okay, well, what happens then if we disturb that equilibrium, if we add more water? Okay, well, if we add more water, the forward reaction will speed up because water is a reactant. You have more collisions, so that part is going to speed up, and because of that, we're going to form more products. Well, now if we have more products, there's a higher concept, you know, we have more product particles colliding and reacting, and then the reverse will also speed up. And so this will keep occurring until um, our forward and reverse reaction rates are again equal. And so we would say that then the system is now at equilibrium again. And so if we, so if we draw a picture of that one, so same thing, time, and then let's do reaction rate. Spelling it right would help. Okay, we've got the forward rate. And we've got the reverse rate. 
and at some point they come together, and then we would say this is at equilibrium. Okay, so this is the forward rate, and this is the reverse rate. And so at equilibrium, forward equals reverse rate. Okay, well, the position of equilibrium of a reaction can be determined by many factors, and this goes back to some stuff that we talked about in Chapter 12. The initial concentrations are going to affect the equilibrium position. The relative energy of the reactants and the products, so, you know, how fast are they moving, things like that. And the relative degree of organization, okay, because we have to have these collisions in order to have reactants go to products and products go to reactants. Um, and so these last two, the relative energy and the degree of organization, are based on the fact that the universe or the system wants a minimum amount of energy and a maximum disorder. And we'll talk about that more later, um, but that's the reason for those two is because we're trying to satisfy those conditions. Okay, well, let's take a look at this reaction, which is the synthesis of ammonia, because we've got ammonia um, as our product here. So when we take... Um, our nitrogen, our hydrogen, and our ammonia mix them all together in a closed vessel, so closed system. There's no change in concentration over time. It basically it looks like it's just sitting there. And so there's two reasons that this could be happening. One is that the system is already at equilibrium, so things are going back and forth, but there's no change. And or the second reason is that the forward and reverse reactions are so slow that the system is moving toward equilibrium at a rate that we can't detect. And with this synthesis of ammonia, it's actually the second um, reason that's why we're seeing this occur. And the reason for that is because N2 and H2, so nitrogen and hydrogen, have very strong bonds. And so in order to break those bonds to produce products, we need a catalyst to speed up that reaction. So, um, based, and then also notice that based on reaction stoichiometry, so if we take a look at our coefficients, Hydrogen disappears three times as fast as nitrogen because of the three here. And ammonia forms twice as fast as the nitrogen disappears. So these would be relative rates based on the coefficient. And let's just look real quick at a graph of um, this reaction. Okay, so we have, uh, just like we looked at before, concentration and time. Let's see, we've got... N2, about right here, and then we've got, because we have three H2s, it's kind of up here, and then our NH3, we're starting from nothing, kind of doing this, because that's at two NH3. Okay, so we see here that they kind of level off, and so now we're at equilibrium. And this reaction just takes a very long time to get there. Okay, so let's take a look at the equilibrium constant, how to kind of put some of these concepts into some math. Okay, well, two Norwegian chemists came up with this uh, idea of the law of mass action, which is a general description of the equilibrium condition. And so we can write it in the equation form where A, B, C, and D represent chemical species, and J, K, L, and M represent their coefficients. And so we can write the equilibrium expression as this. So capital K is equal to concentration of C to the L times concentration of D to the N divided by the product of concentration of A to J times the concentration of B to K. And K is what's called the equilibrium constant. And anything in brackets we know is concentration. But because we're talking about an equilibrium, it's the concentration of the species at equilibrium. And we'll talk a lot more about this equilibrium constant. Okay, so we can calculate the equilibrium constant at given temperatures if we know the equilibrium concentrations of all the reaction components, so basically the A, B, C, and D. And also note that the equilibrium constant has no units, and the process by which this was determined is quite complicated, so we'll just go with the understanding that it has no units. Okay, there are lots of different ways that you can write K and use K. Okay, so here's our reaction. And then we can write our uh, equilibrium expression that we just talked about. But that's not the only way that things are going to occur. So we need to be able to modify our equilibrium constant. So if we reverse the reaction, 
Then we can write our new equilibrium expression. Notice that we have this for the reverse as basically we've just flipped because now these are becoming our reactants and these are becoming our products as it's written. Okay, so all we're doing is flipping. Okay, also we can multiply the original reaction by some factor which we're calling n. So whatever that is. And we'll do some examples of this in class. Um, so it's k with the this symbol. And so we've got the regular uh, reaction or equilibrium expression, but now we've just added this n factor to each of our uh, coefficients. And so that gives us the general form of k to the n power. And then here's that equation that you can write where basically it's the same, only here's this factor of n that's being applied. Because remember, it's got to be applied to all of them. It's kind of like a math equation. Okay, well, let's look a little bit more at K. So K always has the same value at a given temperature. But other things can change. So for the that ammonia synthesis reaction that we looked at, they had 2 plus the H2. At 500 Celsius, K is equal to 6 times 10 to the negative 2. Remember, there you go, no units. And this is regardless of the amount of gases that are mixed initially. It does not matter how much hydrogen and nitrogen you put together. This is the equilibrium constant. So concentrations won't always be the same, okay? but the constant will be. And having different equilibrium concentrations is an equilibrium position. So we can take different sets of equilibrium concentrations, and each one of those is called an equilibrium position. But for all of them, K is the same. Okay, so there is only one equilibrium constant at a particular temperature, but there are infinite numbers of equilibrium positions. And so this is very useful when we're trying to calculate different values using the same K. All right, so we will go over some examples in class, but otherwise this is what we're going to get started on as well. Have a good day.